Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our final panel of the evening, The Role of Government in a Free Society, Education and Social Welfare. My name is Libby Snowden, and I'm the membership director of the student board at the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale, and I'll be moderating this evening's discussion. Between the school board battles we saw take place in Northern Virginia and the tension caused by um, sorry, by state government uh, statutes such as the Stop Woke Act in Florida, and also the learning loss brought on by COVID, it's no secret that the state of education is a very hot topic today. Milton Friedman dedicated a chapter of Capitalism and Freedom, chapter six if you're curious, to his thoughts on education and social welfare. Friedman largely discusses the importance of fostering civic education in primary schools in order to create a stable democratic citizenry with high literacy rates and a set of common values. In today's panel, we'll be exploring both Friedman's and our panelists' ideas regarding education in America and its role in maintaining our free society. And now to introduce today's panelists. Walter Olson is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies and is known for his writing on law, public policy, and regulation. His first book, The Litigation Explosion, was one of the most widely discussed general audience books on law of its time. It led the Washington Post to dub him an intellectual, intellectual guru of tort reform. His books since have stirred discussion on topics ranging from workplace law to mass litigation to the state of law schools. He is known as founder and principal writer of the longest running blog on law, Overlawyered, which ran from 1999 to 2020. He has advised many public officials from town councils to the White House and is an active, an, is an active in civic affairs in his home state of Maryland having been named by Governor Larry Hogan as a co-chair of commissions aimed at ending the practice of gerrymandering. He is often interviewed for his expertise on elections and redistricting law. Before joining Cato, Mr. Olson was associated with the Manhattan Institute and American Enterprise Institute and was editor at the magazine Regulation, which was then edited by Antonin Scalia. He graduated from Yale College in 1975 with a degree in economics. And Inez Felcher Stepman is a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. And she's the host of High Noon with Inez Stepman, a podcast that hosts conversations with heterodox thinkers on a variety of important cultural and political subjects. She has over a decade of experience in education policy and also handles issues related to institutional capture and the, de the definition of sex in law and culture. She's a Lincoln Fellow with the Claremont Institute and a senior contributor at The Federalist. Her work has additionally appeared in outlets such as USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Post. And she has made appearances on Fox News, PBS, C-SPAN, and NPR. Inez has a BA in philosophy from the University of California, San Diego, and a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. And she lives in New York City with her husband. And unfortunately, Mr. Yuval Levin was not able to join us today. He fell sick and did not want to risk bringing that here. Um, but I do hope that you welcome me, or join me in welcoming Inez Stepman and Walter Olson today. Well, thank you, Libby. Um, thank you to Ryan and Lauren and everyone at the Buckley Center uh, for this honor. To reread Capitalism and Freedom uh, today is to find oneself plunged into the policy debates of 2022, not just 1962. Uh, pretty much every chapter, uh, on almost every page, uh, there are thoughts highly relevant to what we are still arguing about. And that is uh, certainly true for some of the arguments like a business social responsibility that you've heard about, but it's equally true for education and social policy. I'm going to be talking more about the social policy and relief of poverty side. And uh, that goes for whether you're going to talk about school vouchers or, in general, the voucherization of uh, programs, uh, whether it's uh, whether welfare itself should be structured as cash grants as opposed to uh, provision of uh, services and, and vouchers. Um, it ties in with questions that Friedman touched on, such as uh, for those interested today in why 
uh, medical costs and higher education costs are such extraordinarily intractable parts of government budgets. Uh, could that have something to do with the fact that both medicine and higher education are self-organized by the people and institutions involved through self-regulation that excludes much possible competition? Yes, that's in there too. And one thing occurs immediately before I get to the substance, which is when people are still talking about your book 60 years later that way, uh, there is something nice that it says about you and also a question that it raises, which may not be so nice. The thing that's nice is, of course, uh, gee, weren't you prescient? Uh, and of course, yes, you know, he was incredibly prescient in selecting issues of durable importance. The less nice thing, of course, is if this is such a great book, how come we're still struggling with all of these same issues? Uh, weren't you supposed to solve them, Milton? And I think he would have a wonderful response to that, but I'm going to save it, and you'll hear it, I think, at the, at the end, if I time myself right. Milton Friedman <coughs> has at least five or six chapters on social welfare broadly defined, because aside from the education chapter, there's one on old age pensions, uh, there is one on uh, the idea that came to be called the negative income tax, uh, there's another one on uh, redistribution, but Friedman took a broad view of what were social welfare programs, and uh, in particular, he said that we need to analyze in the same sorts of terms, not only the programs that are explicitly uh, aimed at the poorest among us, but also the programs that are rationalized and argued for on the basis that they are helping the poor uh, or perhaps keeping people out of poverty. And once you get to that list, it is an extraordinarily long list. I'm going to quote from his chapter 12 on the alleviation of poverty. Uh, this is a defect of farm programs, general old age benefits, minimum wage laws, pro-union legislation, tariffs, licensing provisions of crafts or professions, and so on in seemingly endless profusion. These two are social programs, and one of the things I love about capitalism and freedom is that its long and rightly celebrated chapter on occupational licensure, which set the tone for all subsequent debate, also takes up social welfare uh, questions of what is it doing to the poorest. And I will get to th uh, back to that in a, in a, in a moment, but uh, I wanted to back up for a moment and say that the methodology that Friedman brought to the analysis of uh, this wide range of programs is a methodology that, uh, to a large extent, we still use today. And when I say we, I don't just mean those, those in this room. Uh, Friedman asked a number of questions, one after the next. First, to what extent is the law or program that we're looking at genuinely focused on helping the poor? To what extent uh, are most of its economic effects focused on keeping people, uh, lifting people from poverty? And of course, once you ask that question, you find that most of the things in that list I just read fail. Um, he has a lot of fun with farm price supports, uh, pointing out that if they were intended to rescue poor farmers, they would uh, look extremely different uh, the poorest farmers, of course, are the subsistence farmers who are uh, s scratching a living out of the, the land that they own or farm, and they are the very ones who get not one nickel from farm price supports since they're not selling onto a market. Um, it is, of course, the most successful farmers with the very large successful crops who are getting the most from it. So. Um, you, you find, again, if you go down the list, that most of them, though justified as uh, preventing people from being poor, are in fact very efficiently being farmed or harvested by more affluent groups. Now, the second question was, um, again, before getting into the guts of the program very much, to what extent could the distress of the poor have been relieved by removing government policies or laws that, that the government has itself has previously imposed. And here he, of course, to, to finish off with the farm example, he points out that the farm price support program made food more expensive for the urban poor. You know, it, it was a direct <laughs> program to, to harm the interests of the poor. But you can ask that same question again and again about others. And to circle back to occupational licensure, I love the fact that he raises uh, that among all of the other costs of occupational licensure, it is keeping people who could have earned a living by getting into the line of business. It is keeping them sidelined and sometimes quite poor. And Milton, I think, would have 
really gone to town with the latest law passed by the District of Columbia, uh, which says that if you are going to take care of other people's children for pay, you must have a college degree. Uh, something that, yes, yeah, something that hurts the poor so obviously, both in driving up the cost of childcare that they need, and also in keeping many highly qualified poor people who don't have uh, college degrees from uh, a line of work that they might do extraordinarily well if, if allowed to. So. The third question he asks is, can we disaggregate what the government program is doing? In particular, um, you know, he shows with old age pensions, but also with schooling, with also with uh, housing and other areas, um, is the right answer to have direct government provision? That was typically the answer of the left of his day. Uh, or could it be done through a mandate that people purchase something? Uh, could it be done through a subsidy with or without such a mandate? Again, questions which ever since we have tended to ask to, to create the structure of policy. Uh, and this also helps clarify questions of to what extent is this uh, program intended for paternalistic reasons, to what extent is it genuinely remedying neighborhood effects, which is his more uh, agreeable term for what we tend to call externalities. Uh, and he agreed that there were neighborhood effects. He agreed that sometimes you need to be paternalistic, but he said you need to look it in the eye uh, and uh, get a measurement. And so this type of analysis, as I said, has become the common coin, not just among the sorts of people who would be here today, uh, but also on the center left. And <clears throat> I want to turn for a moment to just how extraordinarily powerful Friedman was in talking to the center left. Uh, <clears throat> it's been mentioned that he got a PBS series, that he was uh, favorably showcased in uh, many of the media outlets of a very liberal period in American journalistic history. Uh, it, um, and th this dialogue, I think, re reflects a number of things. It reflects um, undoubtedly Friedman's own background as someone who lived in liberal university towns, uh, had argued with his own family. Um, it reflects things like his use again and again and again of terms like liberal principles. He would not give up that term liberal. Uh, and in fact, he stops and pauses and says, here's why I'm not giving up that term. And uh, playing on that, uh, the way that he loved to refer to his uh, the, the policies he was criticizing as being mercantilist, like the 17th century, or uh, as in, uh, involving the centralization of decision that you got with monarchy, or at the guild system that you had with the Middle Ages. He loved pointing out that the things that we were in danger of falling into were not new, new fallacies. Uh, and Amity Schley's hit on this so beautifully with her Coco Chanel reference. They're just old stuff that people had forgotten failed. And this was a mode of argument very appealing to reach many of his center-left uh, colleagues and opposite numbers. Uh, on top of that, you had Friedman's truly relentless assumption of good faith in his opponents. You will look through capitalism and freedom and find almost nothing dunking on, as we now put it, the most stupid thing said by advocates of the things he always wanted to address. Um, the most persuasive, uh, the most well-founded, the, the, the good faith arguments that could be offered by the other side. This is why the book is endured, in my view, is that uh, he is speaking, uh, he's not afraid of defending hard cases. He defends you know, uh, <coughs> changes to Social Security. He, uh, he defends um, things that uh, must have taken a lot of courage at the time. Uh, but as he says almost casually uh, in his occupational licensure chapter, I'm going to do doctors because, you know, if I convince you on doctors, I'm going to convince you on everything else. So let's just go straight to doctors. This was his courage, uh, and this was his willingness to do what is nowadays on the Internet called steel manning. That is, imagine your opponent's best argument and respond to it. Uh, it's harder to do than dunking on the worst opponent, I can say, having done both. Now, if you look at the cultural background, you find some interesting things. The, um, 
Freeman talks about block listing, and he actually gives it quite a bit of space. It shows up in the occupational licensure chapter in part because there were much publicized cases of dentists and prize fight organizers um, being threatened with loss of their license because they had been involved in subversive activities. And uh, contrary to some conservatives of his day, uh, Friedman was genuinely um, opposed to that, uh, as I think were many of those in his audience, and he, uh, and he said so. But he also then turned to the moral lesson of the day, which is if, if the spirit of blacklisting is ab abroad, by the way, I said that this was relevant to our contemporary era, even if the sides have changed. If the spirit of blacklisting is abroad in society, do you want to live in so a society where everyone's jobs depend on the government and its contracts and its directives, or would you rather live in a society with a large number of private employers and a large number of private uh, fortunes and uh, independent economic fortunes, which can serve uh, to diversify the types of jobs available? Well, that. I think was exactly the right lesson to draw and has relevance today. If there's time and questions, I'm going to get to the Yale angle I was planning to uh, offer re regarding Professor Charles Reich of Yale Law School, who uh, had this completely opposite career, which nonetheless in 1962 um, kind of um, collided because he too wrote about some of these same questions. But his uh, recommendation was that, um, that people be provided with rights to sue to get welfare and rights to sue to avoid losing medical licenses. Uh, and he called this the new property. And the New York Times was so sufficiently fooled that, they, uh, that, that Reich's obituary a couple of years ago, they described him as an individualist who believed in reducing government bureaucracy. I could have set them straight on that. There isn't really time to, to do the treatment I wanted on that. But I do want to uh, do one last theme before I run out, which is <sighs> James Copeland stole my thunder a bit when he pointed out that 1962 also saw the publication of Buchanan and Tullock's The Calculus of Consent, the founding book of the public choice movement. And if there is a weakness, if there is something that Friedman tends to scant in uh, capitalism and freedom, it's this question of why does politics accept some uh, po good policies and reject others? Why does the political system and the electorate make the decisions it does? And yes, Milton talks about this a bit. He, he refers frequently to the fact that uh, producer's interest is concentrated, consumer's interest is diffuse, uh, producers tend to win because of that. And that helps. That gets us into a number of the issues. But, but at many other times, his theory of how politics acts and how electorates act seems, to use a more modern word, under-theorized. Um, he has a line at one point where he's talking about why doesn't a majority electorate simply uh, turn the government into a redistribution machine, taking money from the rich uh, and, and uh, redistributing it to themselves. And he says that um, we must, let me see if I can get the exact, um, well, he says that um, we must look forward to the self-restraint of the electorate. And that is a phrase that at one point in my career I would probably have chuckled at, self-restraint of the electorate. What kind of theory is that? Um, the more I work on election law, the more I work on the difficulties of setting up a political system so that it does not collapse and produce minority rule, uh, the more I realize, even on that one, it could be that Milton Friedman was way ahead of me. Thank you. I think I'll stay here. Um, thank you, of course, to the Buckley Program for inviting me and, and uh, seating me with such illustrious co-panelists. I also regret Yuval's absence, I'm sure, as he does. Um, so as, as I prepared for uh, this panel, I, I actually took the occasion to reread uh, Capitalism and Freedom, um, and I expected to find in it the extraordinary case for human freedom that I remembered from my first encounter with this book um, a decade ago as a university student, as many of the people in this room are today. Um, but I'm afraid my impressions were probably, probably a little different from Mr. Olson's. Um, while I still find these declarations of freedom in this book, um, perhaps I found myself troubled as to the extent of 
you know, some of Friedman's assertions uh, and their relevance to the problems uh, that we face today, although I will hasten to add that his policy solutions and the topics that he chose remain relevant, as, as uh, Mr. Olson said. Um, and I just, I, in that sense, um, it seems to me that we confront a different set of issues, a very different, very different, um, the dangers come from different places than when uh, capitalism and freedom was written um, versus today. So, for example, um, Friedman writes about the shortcomings of collective pol political decision making through the democratic process. Um, in comparison to the free and individualistic market in which every man can choose from him for himself alone, right, um, among nearly endless options as we, we all enjoy, the political in capitalism and freedom is sort of an imperfect solution of last resort uh, to be avoided if at all possible and if a market solution is feasible. But today it seems to me that the political may be our, our only defense, I guess, again, um, a defense of last resort, so in that sense he was right, um, a defense of last resort against exactly a type of private tyranny that, that uh, the existence of which this book kind of insists is impossible, um, but it seems to me that we are observing today. Um, consider a couple of specific examples. Uh, Friedman points to the fact that the BBC could only refuse Winston Churchill access to the ears of the British public uh, because it was state-owned, and at that time, the state before World War II uh, considered Churchill's warnings about uh, Hitler's rise unacceptably incendiary and radical. Um, and that's true enough so far as it goes. But today, um, the coordinated actions of nearly every major tech company actually collude to strip from the digital public square all ideas contrary to the narratives uh, in which these companies share their beliefs. Um, so even hearings held by our elected officials, like Churchill at the time, um, if they contain unacceptable crime think, have been removed um, from YouTube and sub subsequently are unable to be shared across various platforms, such as congressional hearings, right? Um, so it seems that the private market can indeed accomplish anything the government can do more effectively, sometimes uh, including censorship. Um, Friedman also says the profit motive will protect us from such censorship uh, because, in his words, the publisher cannot afford to publish only books with which he agrees. Um, but we've seen that with books like uh, those of Ryan Anderson, Abigail Schreier, um, and others, especially on the subject of transgenderism, um, we, we actually do see books banned, and more disturbingly, um, if, if Amazon refuses to sell uh, a particular book because of the contents, um, there's a cascading effect into the publishing industry where perhaps new authors who do not have the benefit of the Streisand effect and being able to go on Tucker Carlson um, have no way of fighting back and are simply never published on those subjects. Um, so it seems that the publisher can, in fact, uh, make a living only publishing books with which he agrees, um, at least as long as he can count on all the other major competitors in his market who overwhelmingly want, went to the same schools and subscribed to largely the same ideas about what is acceptable and unacceptable uh, to do the same. So, in fact, as the political sphere has receded, the resulting vacuum has not been filled by a purely free market, um, so much as, as um, Andrew in the previous panel, I think, so, so um, well said, uh, a managerial and bureaucratic class, both public and private. So James Burnham seems the prophet of our times rather than Milton Friedman. Um, but of course, even with these critiques, uh, obviously there's much to recommend this book still uh, in our age. Free that Friedman focused on defending us from collective central planning um, in an era where it was powerfully on the march does not, of course, mean that his work or the many excellent proposals therein should be jettisoned uh, in a fit uh, of, to paraphrase the late Justice Scalia, uh, the smug assurances of our particular age. It's Friedman's great, to, to Friedman's great credit, that many of his ideas and solutions may find a new uh, life and importance even in new circumstances that were very different than his own. And one such great idea is, of course, school choice, um, then imagined as vouchers, now updated as fully flexible education savings accounts. Um, this transition to savings accounts originated actually with Friedman himself uh, in, in 2003 interview with Ed Nex in which he championed what he then called partial vouchers as opposed to a block grant voucher that can only be used or not used as opposed to split apart. Um, 
unlike that kind of voucher, ESAs can be used to assemble a custom education from multiple providers. Um, unused funds also are rolled over year to year, eventually into either a college or in some cases, post high school, high school vocational training fund. Um, which makes ESAs a little bit closer, uh, moves them a little closer to Friedman's most preferred category of spending money, the, the, the category of spending one's own money on oneself. It's not fully that way, of course. It's not fully privatized since these are public funds, but at least it provides an incentive to shop and actually compare for price performance, which a, a block grant voucher um, does not as much. So again, not only did he come up with this idea, he came up with a, a further refinement of it that was um, even superior to his original one. Friedman's arguments for school choice, um, although he does talk about, uh, mo mostly as an um, argument in favor of any public investment in education, um, he does talk about the, the, civic, um, the civic needs of a, a democratic people uh, that, Lily refer, um, that Libby referred to in her introduction. He, he mostly makes what I would describe as uh, sort of libertarian and left liberal arguments for school choice. The former being um, that choice provides, sort of the former being that, that competition creates an upward effect on quality, right? That we will have better and more options if there's more competition introduced to the market of schools. Um, and then the left liberal one being that school choice stands to benefit those who are least well served by the current system, which in our own system um, is likely people uh, who are especially lower income families um, and because of uh, the, the, the fact that many of these families are disproportionately uh, of, of ethnic minorities, he also advanced it on that ground. Um, these arguments remain as true today as when he first advanced them. Um, but there's also an explicitly conservative case for Milton's grand idea of school choice. Um, it's been abundantly clear in recent years the, the leftist indoctrination that William F. Buckley, uh, of course, observed at the institution across the way 70 years ago, um, has consumed not only the academy, uh, but has also spread out from the academy into virtually all of our important institutions, including, of course, the K-12 system. And on the backdrop of that reality, School choice provides two enormous potential benefits for those who hope to conserve even a glimmer of what was once considered the American way of life. So first, it provides not just an escape hatch, as is so frequently touted, but even more importantly, leverage to parents currently swarming school board meetings to object to critical race theory, gender ideology, and other objectionable content in their children's schools. Um, imagine the difference in power dynamics in these confrontations if each angry parent uh, represented the potential loss of $14,500 per year. That's the current average expenditure, and that doesn't include um, all of the, the COVID funds that have not been spent. Um, there will actually be more COVID funds spent in 2026, or 2026 than either of the last two years. Um, <laughs> but that, that doesn't include that. But even without that, it's, it's, it's just over $14,000 uh, per student. Um, parents, I think, would re uh, likely receive a very different reception than the range of indifference to outright hostility uh, that they have faced under present circumstances if their dissatisfaction was tied directly to the salaries of teachers, administrators, and principals. Um, the consumer power that Friedman so eloquently championed uh, could be a powerful tool in the culture war as well um, if, if allowed to work within the school system. Second, a uh, broad-based or universal school choice allows the right, or, or even uh, perhaps just the sane, uh, to claim our rightful share of the enormous public investment in secondary education. Um, now it's a staggering $800 billion a year, and again, that does not account for COVID funds. Um, not only would less of that money uh, being directly, uh, sort of using, being used directly to fund the ideas of our opponents, um, it would be used positively. It would be invested in institutions that would not be inherently hostile to us, our values, our children, um, but it would provide a critical jump start to, and I wish Yuval was here to, to, um, to talk about the subject, but to, I think, what is the, the most critical uh, sort of challenge before the right today, which is really to build alternative institutions to those who are ha hopelessly captured by the left. Um, so to paraphrase Freedom, Friedman himself, if parents can choose that administrators, now enthralled to their new woke religion, cannot dictate. Uh, and I think that that is definitely um, one of the strongest arguments today for school choice. 
Um, indeed, these cultural arguments have been the cause, along with uh, the potent accelerant of pandemic school closures, of what, to be honest, has been the most successful year for school choice in two decades. In 2021 legislative session, um, 18 states expanded or created school choice programs. West Virginia went from having no school choice, including charter schools at all, uh, to passing both charters, a, a charter law and most importantly, universal education savings accounts being the first in the country to implement such a law. Nevada passed one, but then it got tied up in the courts. It has not been implemented. Um, so this will be the first implemented universal school choice program in the country. Um, in addition to K-12 education, Friedman's ideas and policy suggestions retain much relevance in many of the sectors most financially pressing to the beleaguered middle class. Um, Orrin Cass of American Compass has noted that there are three most devastating financial pressures on the middle class and working class households right now in America are those of housing, health care, and higher education. Um, I think all three could use a heavy dose of Milton, uh, but, but I'll leave the first two to others who are more expert in those areas of policy than I am. Uh, but in the case of the third, in higher education, the evidence is even more overwhelming than 60 years ago uh, that far from opening opportunities to lower income students as intended, government programs like grants and subsidies for student loans um, have made them ever more insulated bastions of elitism and leftist ideas. Uh, after more than 50 years of enormous subsidies and student loans designed to help those low-income students, students from families in the lower half of the income spectrum actually make up a smaller percentage of those on campus than they did 50 years ago. In other words, this Great Society program has done exactly the opposite of what it was intended to do, as with so many of these programs. Uh, universities, on the other hand, have used uh, these en same enormous subsidies on the backs of the American taxpayer to become extremely rich and powerful as conduits to the elite. Um, it's clearer than ever that higher education, the woke monster, uh, is fed heavily by higher education, the heavily subsidized monster um, on the backs of the American taxpayers, the majority of whom do not attend college or receive a four-year degree. Um, so to conclude with reference to the title of this panel, uh, in looking around us today, it's been, become clear that the proper role of government in a free society must at some level include the role of cultivating the sort of citizens who can per perpetuate a free society. That might be a vision of government, perhaps too energetic to fit comfortably in the vision describing capitalism and freedom. Um, but while the free market is undoubtedly the best economic system for producing prosperity, and here in this country, um, producing it at a level completely unheard of in human history, um, it's not a panacea, and we shouldn't restrain ourselves arbitrarily from searching outside its boundaries for solutions to the particular challenges of our age. In 1973, Milton Friedman uh, actually invited Irving Kristol to deliver a lecture to the Mont uh, Pelerin Society, which at that time Friedman headed, um, that Crystal was invited to give the critiques I'm about to read at all suggests, I think, that Friedman himself found arguments along these lines a compelling and troubling challenge, uh, at least to some degree, to his own ideas. Um, among Crystal's remarks, um, I've edited a little bit uh, for time, but it's still long, so bear with me. I know I'm, I'm going on a bit long. Um, so Crystal, Crystal said, one of the most extraordinary features of our civilization today is the way in which the counterculture of the new left is being received and sanctioned. Our capitalists embrace the ethos of the new left for only one reason. They cannot think of any reason why they should not. Friedman assumes, as I read him, that one must not interfere with the dynamics of self-realization in a free society. He further assumes that these dynamics cannot, in the nature of things, be self-destructive, that self-realization in a free society can only lead to the creation of a self compatible with such a society. But what if the self that is realized under the conditions of liberal capitalism is a self that despises liberal capitalism and uses its liberty to subvert and abolish a free society? To this question, Hayek and Friedman have no answer. And yet, this is the question we now confront as a society relentlessly breeds more and more such selves. Perhaps we can say that the secular libertarian tradition of capitalism simply has too limited an imagination when it comes to vice. It could never really believe that, that, the vi the, that vice, unconstrained by religion, morality, and law, might lead to viciousness. Um, 
It could never really believe that self-destructive nihilism was an authentic and permanent possibility that society had to guard against. It could refute Marx effectively, but it never thought it would be called upon to refute the Marquis de Sade or Nietzsche. Friedman's free market can produce and sell us whatever we desire um, better than any system ever devised. I, please understand, I am a capitalist. Um, <laughs> but it, it cannot tell us what if what we desire is good or compatible with the continuation of the very free society that sustains the capitalist system itself. It may be that the self, as Crystal so presciently described, um, so fully realized in an abundant capitalist economy Absent additional normative commitments, um, the free market itself can never provide, um, is incapable of sustaining a free society. Without such pre-modern concerns as a conception of the common good, um, commitment to neutral and uh, non-neutral normative values about what constitutes the good life, um, it's possible that we cannot muster any defenses against the self-destructive and nihilistic impulses that threaten not just the capitalist system, uh, but the entirety of the American project. I have too much respect for Milton Friedman to imagine him a dogmatist. I don't think anybody can read Milton Friedman and think of him as kind of uh, a rote dogmatist, merely repeating. Um, he's, he's very pragmatic, and that's part of the reason that uh, I think his, his work has endured as long as it has. Um, Indeed, in successive editions of Capitalism and Freedom, he admirably faces up to some of the challenges to his worldview posed by China and its blend of economic liberalization alongside political tyranny. Um, perhaps if we were lucky enough to still have him with us today and get another edition of, of uh, Capitalism and Freedom, uh, he would have a good response to some of its seeming shortcomings in addressing the problems of a totally different era. Um, Many of the ideas in, in Crystal's 1973 speech uh, that I quoted found their way into a later article titled Two Cheers for Capitalism. Um, I'd like to close by offering on the occasion of its 60th birthday, uh, two cheers, but not three, for Friedman's classic tour de force, Capitalism and Freedom. Thank you. All right, thank you both uh, for such fantastic opening remarks. Um, so I have a question, and as you mentioned how uh, for every parent that would decide that they're gonna pull their kid out of a public school system, that would represent a loss of $14,500 per student per year, uh, which made me think of this quote in chapter six of Capitalism and Freedom, where Milton explains that, quote, the problem is not primarily that we are spending too little money, though we may be, but that we are getting so little per dollar spent. And then he goes on to say that the parent who would prefer to see money used for better teachers and texts rather than coaches and corridors has no way of expressing his, this preference except by persuading a majority to change the mixture for all. So I was just wondering if both of you could provide some insight on this idea of trying to influence the majority but also spending the money on oneself, how that is like the most, um, sorry, the the highest kind of epitome of what capitalism, ca capitalism is and does for society. Um, with, with regard to sort of the bloat in cost, one of the amusing things about rereading this is seeing what the figures are, even inflation adjusted, right? Um, they were already skyrocketing in, in Friedman's time when he wrote this, um, but they've skyrocketed even more since. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there isn't a, a really strong connection between spending more money on the education system and getting better results. Um, that's pretty consistent in all of the legitimate, I will say, literature. You can, of course, there are always lies, white lies, and statistics, so you can always massage the data to show whatever you'd like, and, and many uh, academics do, but the most uh, gold standard studies in this don't show a particularly strong correlation between an additional spending and, um, for example, test scores and math or reading. Um, well, where has all that money gone? Well, largely to administration, which is another one of um, Friedman's prescient critiques in education. He gave a, a great talk um, in, in New York City highlighting how, how education had become bureaucratized and that bureaucracies often work for their own benefit and not for the ostensible benefit for the children um, and for their educations that everyone is ostensibly spending the money on. Just, just one uh, couple brief statistics on, in this regard. The, um, so the, the population of students between in the last 50 years in our schools has gone up by about 8%, um, so just marginal increase. 
the, the proportion of administrators hired has gone up by about 700% in the same, uh, <laughs> same time period. And in fact, if we normalize just since the 90s, if we hired only proportionally more administrators as the increase in the student population, we would be able to give every teacher in states anywhere from a five to a $20,000 raise overnight merely with the additional bureaucratic money. So any complaints about teacher, uh, teacher salaries, which genuinely have staff stagnated over the last 10 years um, should be directed instead to the, the bureaucratic office at the district. Uh, <clears throat> let me start by saying that uh, if you're going to go back and read any of Capitalism and Freedom, uh, really read the voucher chapter. It is so excellent and uh, with help from a couple of other sections of the book, it is remarkably prescient and hitting almost every issue that um, you might think. On um, the structure of teacher pay, for example, he has a throwaway. It's no longer than a paragraph. It might not even be that long, uh, saying that if we were to design a system of pay and qualification to suppress the uh, recruitment of good teachers, we could do little better than the one. And this was in 1962. We all know how much worse it's gotten in between. But the, fa the flatness of teachers pay, whether they are the best teacher or worst teacher in the school, the fact that completely meaningless certifications count for more than um, anything that parents or, or students might be willing to testify about the excellence of teaching, this was already the, the quality of the system in 1962. And he comes right out and says it. Um, on another thing where, again, it's a throwaway line, um, he mentions that um, we do, in fact, have an um, elaborate way of uh, distinguishing between the education that the poor get and the education that the rich get. It is the stratification of neighborhoods. Now, he doesn't make much of that. And in a way, it's impossible, I think, to understand why a cause as obviously good as school choice has not made more progress without getting deeper into that question of uh, everyone has uh, placed the reliance on the stratification of neighborhoods and what would happen if that were yanked out like a rug from underneath it. Um, that is, I would argue, why we don't actually get school choice despite its obvious superiority as a, uh, as, as a policy, and yet there it is in there. Um, he even talks about indoctrination, and I think in exactly the right way, uh, Cato has a program on public school choice which emphasizes the fact that uh, differences on uh, what you might call culture war issues um, are intrinsic to the population. Uh, a, a healthy system ought to allow people to send their kids to schools to reflect their values, which means liberal values for liberal families as well as conservative values for conservative families. Friedman is right on it when he says that as soon as the uh, notion of civic education, as soon as the idea of the formation of good future citizens for the state gets any further than the three R's and the lowest grades, um, it immediately treads into issues uh, which will produce disagreement from some of the parent base and it finds itself indoctrinating. If you don't want indoctrination, you can't just say, let's have a system in which good civic education, in my particular idea of what society needs, is inculcated in everyone. You should be going for, for uh, uh, school choice instead. Believe it or not, you can see the seeds of the culture war and how much they have harmed the schools just by reading Milton Friedman's little throwaway line about indoctrination. And finally, although this is in a different chapter, uh, Friedman has some very shrewd insights about how often it takes uh, a crisis to change things. This is not, of course, a view specific to him or a view specific to free marketeers. You can find it among you know, the, the people who want to expand the government because there are crises and emergencies. But it, it really, really was seen, um, Ms. Stepman pointed out that the COVID closures of schools, the extraordinary um, episode in which the uh, welfare of some of the providers, once again, a focused, well-organized uh, interest, was placed over the interest of the parents and the students. Uh, no wonder this fueled uh, the kind of interest that finally got school choice over some of the humps. Uh, it took a scandal like that. So um, I just have a couple things to add uh, to that. Why school choice hasn't exploded until now? Yes, part of it is absolutely uh, the crisis created by school closures that went on um, 
in, in, in many states far longer than any, any reasonable person, no matter what they believed or felt about coronavirus. Um, we had states in which casinos were open and schools were closed. Uh, th there is no possible public health justification, I would argue, for, for that result. It only makes sense if you look at the political power of teachers unions. Um, and, and uh, I agree with, with uh, what Mr. Olson referenced. Uh, his colleague, Neil McCluskey, at the Cato Institute has written about uh, the, the sort of um, de-escalatory effect uh, on cultural battles of, of being able to send your kids to a school with which you will agree with the values. Um, I, I must say that in recent years, I've found more sympathy with the common school system than I, I ever have. Um, I, I used to revile James G. Blaine and his anti-Catholic uh, ideas about um, the common school system, but, but I, I find it part, particularly a devastating critique of our common school system. The only legitimate justification, in my view, and, and of course um, Friedman to some extent disagrees with this, and um, criti critics, modern conservative critics of the common school system obviously agree with it as well, that the only, even the, the closest justification for building a common school system might be actually to, to promulgate some kind of e pluribus unum, right? Um, to, to, to promulgate the American idea at that time uh, to, to the children of immigrants with, with um, wildly different views and religious views than, than uh, the, the system at the time was willing to accept. Um, it, it, it does seem to be to be a final nail in the coffin of the common school system that we currently have um, under the influence, of course, of Prussian ideas. Um, is that the, the system that we've created to essentially create new Americans um, and teach them how to be citizens in a constitutional republic is now, the, the I would say, among the primary forces driving anti-Americanism and alienation from that system. Um, so I, I, it seems to me that vastly preferable at this point would be to take the captured ideological, not just financial, but ideological market share of the left in K-12 and at least deliver it uh, individually to parents where uh, I think on the balance um, it will shake out much more favorably to the ideas that do sustain a free society than the current education system. All right, with that we'll move to some audience questions. Let's see, um, over here, gentleman in the brown blazer. Thanks so much, and for some great commentary. I'd like to follow up on Ms. Stepwin's spot-on analysis referencing Irving Kristol and the concern that there are certain pre-liberal features and notions that can be deemed essential to the flourishing of a modern liberal society. It reminds me of a book titled by Daniel Mahoney called The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order. As one who's very persuaded by that need, I'd like to ask you and our panelists what, if anything, can and should be done to try to reinforce and elicit and prepare the ground for those foundations to be strengthened within our 21st century liberal order? Um, well, that's, that's the really the, the question on deck, isn't it? Uh, I, I found myself very convinced by the metaphor that's been in use for quite some time about the flowers you know, cut in the vase and, and the fact that they can sustain themselves for some time, but not forever, right? Um, that's kind of how I feel now, that we are essentially running out of water. Uh, we are running out of, without deeper roots. And of course, our founding is not exclusively liberal, right? I think only somebody dishonest would write Locke out of our founding, right? Um, obviously, liberal ideas, not you know French liberal ideas, but, but um, liberal ideas and Lockean liberalism was an enormous influence on the founding of this country and has brought us, as I said, prosperity, freedom, all good things. Um, but that wasn't the only influence on the founding. There, there are certain classical and small r Republican ideas involved in our founding. And of course, there are traditionalist ideas and the great influence of the Christian religion. By the way, I'm an atheist, okay? So this, this is not a, a sort of, I don't say that to evangelize, um, but merely to describe that there were countering influences to liberalism um, that allowed the founding, in the founding, the assertion of certain truths um, outside of the neutral liberal process and undergirding them. Um, and I think a good start would be for states to get, especially on the state level, I would say, um, to get a little more energetic in taking that, that um, state power that is granted to them, which was originally to, to regulate the health, safety, and morals 
um, of, of the population. Uh, I, I think we ought to take that a little more seriously, starting with in education, actually um, promulgating standards affirmatively that in, in the public schools uh, do teach a proper version of, for example, of American history. Uh, th this was not considered anti-liberal until literally 30 years ago. And it's only controversial today because we have allowed ourselves, essentially post-1960s, to fall into a version of liberalism that, that uh, you know, essentially leaves out a lot of room for the democratic process. Um, and I, I just, I don't agree with that notion of liberalism. I, I am a liberal, but I'm, let's say, a pre-1960s liberal in many ways. Um, <clears throat> there are certainly parts of the uh, crystal critique I have not uh, read the uh, Maloney, um, parts of the crystal critique with which I would be fine. I believe in uh, objective morality. I believe that character uh, counts and uh, will undermine a society if, if enough people are a bad character. At the same time, I have literally, since I was an undergraduate in this institution, I have been hearing uh, traditionalist conservatives say that people like me are living on the moral inheritance of the past. And when, once we spend through that in moral inheritance, uh, we are going to be the Sam Bankman Freeds of the uh, mor moral uh, and political world. And it still ain't happened. Um, you know, I could point to the fact that uh, uh, and and uh, Ms. Stepman, I'm glad brought in the question of religion because, uh, as that indicates, it is more complicated. You have heavily secular societies, um, you know, Japan, Finland, whatever, that uh, for whatever reason, without that particular base of reassurance and support, uh, managed to achieve low crime. Uh, you know, high marriage rates, the uh, parents love their children. I mean, all sorts of amazing things happen, even though they are not based on uh, a, a moral inheritance of the past uh, being spent down. So uh, there comes a point, you know, Milton Friedman, more than most of us, realized that past inheritances can be spent down because he knew about the glorious history of 19th century liberalism and all of the private institutions and all of the scientific advances and all of the moral advances that it had brought. And then he had, to some extent, the ability to remember at least the latter part of the extraordinary degeneration by which uh, in the 1930s uh, uh, we had forgotten lots of the lessons uh, people had become um, much more uh, favorable toward collectivism. So, of course, things can decline, uh, and things can dec decline based on bad ideas spreading. Um, I would only say that all of us, to the extent that we count ourselves as participants in the market of ideas, you know, get out there and do persuasion. That is usually the answer. All right, another question. Uh, how about our fellow here in the middle, in the dark gray blazer? Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, in the most recent midterms, uh, Gen Z, um, my generation, voted for Democrats by a 28-point margin. How much of that do you attribute to our current education system, and what do you propose that conservatives do to align the views of Gen Z closer to their uh, base in the future? So I'd begin with the unfortunate reality, in my view, that indoctrination works. Um, <laughs> and those who suggest otherwise are often uh, sort of instinctive contrarians who would become dissidents in almost any system. Um, but, but I think you really do see in, uh, in poll data, issue to poll data, you see a really large break between Gen X and millennials. Right, um, and then furthermore, Gen Z. Right, so like there's there's a break between Boomers, Gen X on one side, and Millennials and Gen Z on the other side. I don't I don't subscribe to the notion that young people are always and inherently liberal. Um, so I, I don't think this is going to be quote unquote fixed by real life. Um, I think that was one of the, the comforting shibboleths we repeated to ourselves as we saw what was happening increasingly on college campuses. It's okay if the, the crazy, the crazy blue haired protesters, right? Um, they're gonna get out into the quote real world um, and they're gonna figure out a few hard truths about taxes and uh, about working a hard day's, uh, uh, you know, earning a hard day's wage, um, and they're going to moderate their ideas and become normal normal citizens <laughs> like the rest of us, right? Uh, I think what's happened instead is they've remade the, the real world in their image, 
Um, and, and that's fundamentally, I, I put a lot of our current situation um, at the feet of the right more broadly for essentially ignoring for more than 70 years the left's dominant takeover in cultural institutions, um, especially institutions of education, right? William F. Buckley wrote uh, Got a Man at Yale 70 years ago. Uh, nothing, essentially nothing has been done about that for 70 years. You cannot imagine that um, the, the sort of education system and the nation's best and brightest will be uh, sort of attendant in schools that all teach largely some version of the same thing. Yes, there are exceptions. Yes, there's you know poor Professor George up there in Princeton, uh, so lonely. <laughs> um, of course, there are exceptions, but overwhelmingly teaching the same thing. You cannot imagine that those students who are currently having a meltdown over Ilya Shapiro's tweets are not going to be running, or indeed are already running, places like the DOJ. So. This is, I, I do lay a lot of the blame for where we're at, at the right's insistence on ignoring the importance of actually fighting for and capturing these kinds of institutions. The long march worked. Um, I am literally a boomer and old enough to have tracked the change in uh, social connotations of blue hair from uh, <laughs> Yes, it's true. You know, to, to, to us, the, these were rich old ladies. And, um, the, um, and I bring a bit of what I think should be reassurance, because I wrote an article once on the boomer generation, um, fairly scathing. Um, but it, uh, I consulted the public opinion polls gathered by my former colleague, Carlin Keane at American Enterprise Institute. And uh, one of the most striking was that the votes uh, of the youngest uh, <coughs> tranche in 1972 in the Nixon-McGovern election uh, had that same uh, remarkably more liberal, um, uh, they, you know, they, they voted for McGovern by, I forget whether it was 20, 25, 30 points, but at any rate, it, it, it seemed to be an extraordinary generational wave. Um, by the time Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, that generation had adjusted its views through, call it whatever, experience, uh, distance from uh, youthful illusions to the point where they were exactly as pro-Reagan as all of the generations that preceded them. Uh, what seemed to be a generational disturbance in the force turned out to wash itself out. Uh, and I always go with the simplest theories. I think something or other is going to come along uh, and uh, sober up those millennial or those, those uh, most recently born millennial voters. Um, I don't, we have run out of time or I would go on longer, but don't, you know, most, most generalizations about generations are complete garbage. Just ignore them. <laughs> All right, as Mr. Olson did just mention, we are out of time. Um, please join me, though, in thanking Mr. Olson and Ms. Stepman one more time for their time today.